Hi, Rachel. Hi. Okay. I think we did it, right? We did. Uh, we have five more minutes to start, so all good. Okay. So first you're going to talk about the report. Then I'm yeah. going to talk. And how long do I talk for? Ten minutes. Uh, I mean, yeah, I'm going to try and give you as much time as possible. I, I like to focus mm -hmm. on, 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 on use cases, uh, kind of uh, feeds the, the purpose. Okay. So I'm going to try to, to make mine fast. Uh, I will be pushing the report for them anyway. I don't want to, to give the whole report yeah. away. Um, and that's it. So I have a, a one okay. minute info about the alliance and then uh, All right. like, okay. like around 10, 10, 12 minutes about the, the right. overall aspect of things. And then you'll get another 10 almost seven oh, but the so. way people will ask questions right exactly yeah okay all right
All right, I think we wait 30 more seconds and we can start, uh, Rachel. All right, sounds good. All right, I want to thank everyone for joining our session. We will be starting very soon. Rachel, can you see my screen? Yes, I can see your screen, that's perfect. Okay, perfect. All right, so let's start. Um, yes, Carol, I can see your screen. If you want to give like just one or two minutes, so everyone uh, okay. would be able to join from the beginning. Okay, sure. Yeah. All right, I'll give uh, a, a, yeah. a couple currently more Currently there are uh, nine, nine attendees uh, currently. Okay, perfect. Okay. Okay, uh, Sharbel, uh, just to, Sharbel or Charles, I forgot. Yeah, Charles. Char okay, uh, one thing, the moderation panel, uh, when I click it, it doesn't open. It will open when somebody is asking for a request. Yeah, it okay. Yeah, it doesn't open. It just shows uh, the faces of the people who request to join. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, whenever they, okay. they request. Okay, okay, okay. okay. Perfect. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. All right. Charles, I'm I'm going to start the session now. I think it's uh, it's only fair. We have uh, many people who've been waiting already. Okay. I'm gonna share my screen. And here we go. All right. Thank you all for joining us today uh, for this entitled. Um, well, actually, I'm calling it championing a gender intelligent fintech sector um, because I think it is about gender intelligent and it's very important for the sector to wake up. Um, it's not only about equality, but it's about really being smart about how we uh, enter the game when it comes to gender. Um, a very, very quick overview of who we are as the Financial Alliance for Women. So we are 
an alliance or an international trade association of large commercial financial service providers. Uh, we currently have 65 members, uh, most of which are uh, banks, uh, but also payment companies, insurance companies, and most recently, um, fintechs. And what we do, what actually our members do is they offer women a holistic value proposition, uh, coupling both financial services and non-financial services to offer a complete 360 degree support uh, for women to succeed. Um, and our members today cover more than 80 different countries and reach 77 women customers and make who uh, either have more than $217 billion deposited and have had access to more than $220 billion in credit provided. So therefore really uh, accelerating the financial power of women and creating financial inclusion where necessary. What we offer as an alliance to our customers is as well as another unique customer value proposition built on peer learning, research and knowledge, data analytics, and a lot of advocacy and impact. We offer peer learning, uh, whether in person or virtual, uh, and within our peer learning activities, we have recently included uh, a hackathon, uh, which we organized for the first time in 2020 as part of our new mission and new strategy to really uh, start integrating the fintech and the tech uh, industry within uh, this journey of really closing the financial inclusion gap and, ch and championing the female economy. We do a lot of research and knowledge and I would like to talk about now a little bit about our uh, newest research we launched into fintechs and the understanding the real value of the, the female economy. We do a lot of data analytics, so we gather a lot of data from our 65 members um, and are able to then make a, a global uh, showcase of what the real female economy looks like and the real value of really serving them properly. And then we do a lot of advocacy and impact with a, a very large uh, network of partners, uh, making sure that all across the world, everybody is aware that <clears throat> of the support that can be given to women and the value that we will get out of this. So to come back on the real subject on the table, um, earlier this year, we conducted a research we conducted research on how fintechs can actually profit from the multi-trillion dollar female economy. Uh, the idea was to understand how women are being captured and catered to by fintechs, and if they are being catered to uh, properly, uh, and what and how there is a large opportunity that is out there that can still be catered for. <coughs> it's about understanding that women are not only uh, it's not only on, about financial inclusion, but rather really seeing the real business opportunity that is out there. Um, our sample included 168 fintechs across 43 countries and more than 30 investors who we believe are also a critical factor uh, within the fintech ecosystem. And uh, with that, uh, we did both qualitative and quantitative research to really understand the, 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 serious, the story that is out there today. What we found are the following. The research revealed that there are many fintechs that do have access to sex disaggregated data. Now, sex disaggregated data is very critical in, in terms of really being able to understand the real opportunity that uh, you know, the, the female economy does represent. And what this funnel shows is that while we have uh, you know, enough sex disaggregated data, let's say at a starting point when it comes to really understanding the, the total addressable market, then at every single level when we start moving forward, we have less and less uh, data available or when it is available, it is not being used properly. And so what we're saying is, yes, we have uh, fintechs that are capturing the data, but we also have a challenge of really fintechs understanding what to do with that data. And unless you really know the total value of your total addressable market and then your users and then following your user to really understand the lifetime value of your your clients and the cost of acquisition uh, and the usage that comes with your uh, with your um, female let's say users then you don't really understand the real opportunity that is out there and therefore you can never really become a gender intelligent uh, institution and really cater for those for that uh, target market. 
<clears throat> now, many of the challenges comes from the fact that there are many biases. Um, biases can come or uh, can be of you know various uh, backgrounds it can be based on team composition if you have a team that is made of more male then the tendency of the program and the products and the services you are providing will be uh, designed in a particular way and will not really take into account the various uh, intricacies that might come with a, a different segment that you might be serving which could be the female in this cage uh, usage biases might include uh, maybe from the get-go the 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 real understanding because by default people have the tendency to believe that when when so when data is not really being used properly you tend to believe the myths that are mostly commonly used uh, out there and so this means that uh, by common misconception let's say there is a notion that women are not early adopters of apps and technology but rather men are and so if you believe in that and you build your product to serve what you would consider the largest addressable market, which would be men, and then your men are your early adopters, then your data is already to start with bias because your data is based on your uh, members and your members are actually people you thought you should cater to. And therefore it starts leading one, you know, it starts just building up and piling up. And therefore you're, when you start analyzing your data, you say, okay, so then men are my major clients and they're the one who are giving me the profitability, but to start with, your starting point was wrong because you 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 launched it based on a myth and not on actual total addressable market uh, data and it was based on the misconception that women are not early adopters and what i want to show here is oddly what our research proved for us which is that one uh, 64 percent of the customers uh, who actually of our of the survey the, the fintechs who captured sex segregated data found that 64% of them found that women had similar or higher usage rates than men. And so that in itself kind of demystifies the common myth that women are not early adopters or women are not uh, as users of technology and, and apps as men are. Um, and when you start seeing such data, that's when you start really understanding the real opportunity that is out there and a lot of the misconceptions on which uh, many of our products and services are based today. To moving moving forward, uh, another uh, very critical finding is that <clears throat> the the of the the fintechs that do have sex segregated data, 95% found that the cost of acquisition for women is less than or equal to that of men, and then of the same fintechs that do uh, calculate and capture sex segregated data, 86% found that lifetime value for women is higher or equal than that of men and 43 percent said it is definitely higher than that of men now if you look at all of these then what you know is that most of the fintechs and in the tech industry you know that the the customer profitability and and the lifetime value to cac ratio is one of the most important ratios that is captured uh, by institutions and it's also looked at by investors and imagine that if you have a, a lifetime value by cac ratio of three to one is usually what you look for and if that's what you already have with your uh, male segments and looking at all these positive numbers for women, then it means that the lifetime value by CAC ratio of women is going to be even better or similar at worst to that of men, uh, which means that there is a serious business sense out there that, um, you know, targeting women it is only going to make uh, business sense. And we need to really understand that it is about profitability. It is a serious business opportunity and it's being left on the table. And but the fringe benefit of it is is that it also brings financial inclusion but it's not only the essence on which it is based so really doing it doing it properly is is very critical and maybe before i, I move on to what are the the main let's say six levers of of what needs to be done to make sure that you are building a gender intelligent and and the gender equal if you want uh more commonly uh, told um institution or or company uh some some of the stats that you need to know is that today women control uh, there isn't sorry there women control uh, more than 24 billion a trillion dollars of uh, income on a yearly basis and 89 percent of the day-to-day -day spendings are controlled actually and taken charge by women and so this means that you have a serious opportunity uh, to really leverage and to capitalize on the women's market. And we also know for sure that there is at least at least $1.7 trillion uh, of unmet demand or credit. 
And if we really look at it, we know that women are not only underserved, but they are also unserved. Um, and, and only 67% of women have access to, or 65% of women actually, uh, receive financial services compared to 72% of men. And of the women who do have access to financial services, 70% are dissatisfied. And so this means that there is a serious opportunity that needs to be grabbed um, and, and it needs to be done properly. Uh, it needs to be done based on data and based on real value and analysis and, and analytics of that. And so it only makes business sense for, you know, for women, uh, for the institutions uh, such as yours uh, to really consider uh, tapping into the female economy because what we know for sure is that women not only consume for themselves, they also consume for the household, they are loyal, uh, you know, and, and, and they have better repayment. We've seen this within the incumbent sector uh, over the, the, the past 20 years, and we have, you know, we've seen this across the globe and it just makes real sense and it works for, for the banks and we see that it is actually uh, almost similar uh, when it comes to fintechs and fintechs do have the advantage of being able to capture data a lot more than than the banks do and and what needs to be done is to make sure that um, that data is actually being captured the right way and that it is being used in the right way so um, moving on so maybe just uh, uh, the you know highlighting the main points is one Embrace that there is a business case, there is a serious opportunity. Use the data, uh, create sex, uh, you know, capture that sex segregated data, use it properly. Uh, try to be gender intelligent, really uh, work to, uh, in ways to do market research to understand uh, the needs of the female uh, economy and to really be able to provide and, and uh, services and products that caters for those needs in particular uh, and not what you think they would want, but they actually what they say they need. Uh, and trust me, when you make uh, your products and your services to cater for women, trust me, it will work for men as well. So uh, that's definitely something that needs to be done. And probably one of the most important things, and we'll hear about more about this uh, and about data as well with Rachel uh, from time, who's with us, and about partnerships. So partnerships are key. Uh, it's how you are earning trust. It's how you're building uh, your reputation. It's how you're entering a whole new market. It's how you're getting new networks. It's how you're get pushing your own products and services. Uh, and, and you can create partnerships at very many different levels. Uh, so it's really, really important to do that. And then most of all, also align with policymakers and investors. Uh, there's a lot of advocacy work that we as the Alliance will do, but there's also a lot of work that the fintechs uh, themselves can do in making sure that uh, you know they're creating uh, the awareness that's needed because the investors and the policymakers as well uh, need to start adopting this uh, you know gender intelligent approach to really serving um, to serving the market. Um, uh, with that, I'm actually going to pass it to you, Rachel. Uh, I think uh, I'd like to maximize on your presence as well with uh, with a real life example. Uh, so maybe Rachel uh, Rachel Freeman's with us. She's the chief growth officer for Time Bank in South Africa. Uh, so Rachel, I'm going to pass it on to you. Uh, maybe you give us a quick interview uh, introduction to Time, and then you tell us about your story and women. All right. Uh, well, All right. Uh, well, thank you very much. Can you hear me? Thank you very much. Yes, perfectly. Right. It seems like there's an echo. All right. Maybe, yeah, that's better. So Time is a digital banking network. Uh, we are, I'm calling in from Hong Kong, and we are a Hong Kong-based company with our major deployment is in South Africa. Uh, we have now, this week, we're going to be hitting 2.5 million customers. We started our digital bank in February of 2019. So we've made a lot of progress uh, since we started the bank. We're the first digital bank in South Africa, and we have a very interesting way to onboard customers uh, that we'll just I'll talk about and show you, then get into how we're operating with women and how we use data. At time, we actually disseminate data to the whole team, both the Hong Kong people as well as South, in South Africa. We have about 200 people there. And so that we can track on a daily basis how we're actually uh, interacting with our customers, what is the activity rate that we're getting, and how many customers we have, uh, men or women, what geography, income levels. And we think all of this data is super experienced 
important uh, to build out the best products and services. All right, okay, so just a little bit of how we work. Um, I say we're a digital bank, and but we believe that digital bank means that we're digital on the back end. We have no paper inside the bank. We are. We have no middle office. We have was no back office. Uh, everything is all our processes, all our procedures are all done digitally. Uh, but we actually believe that people like people, and so we do have touch when we are dealing with account opening and a customer education. Uh, what we think is important is to actually integrate into people's lives. And so when we're working in, in onboarding customers, we do this in the grocery stores. You can see that we have a kiosk in the picture with an ambassador. So a customer walks up to the kiosk in the grocery store and can, in South Africa, open a bank account in under three minutes. Uh, it's a super easy process, but we do all of the AML sanction screening, everything that you would need to do for EKYC is all done uh, in the background while the kiosk is interacting with the customer. Once the customer opens the account, then they can learn more about that account from an ambassador. You don't have to interact with the ambassador, the kiosk is completely self-service, but with the ambassador, you can learn how to use the account. What we believe is that most banks actually don't really educate their customers on how to use the account uh, when they're opening accounts. So we've tried to change that by uh, having the ambassadors talking to uh, the customers. About 70% of our ambassadors are women, and I think that's why one of the reasons that we have more women than most men customers right now. So once you get open the banking account, you actually get a personalized debit card from the kiosk. And you can take that to the cash register at the grocery store and do cash in and cash out. Uh, it's a very easy process. Uh, the cash register, they're not agents. We use a tokenized mechanism uh, so that any cash register can do this in the whole network, which means that when we launched the bank, we had about 14,000 uh, cash in and cash out deposit places as well as the people could use ATMs from other financial institutions. This meant that we had the largest footprint in South Africa on our first day of operation. Uh, this has all been super important for onboarding and making people feel very comfortable with a digital bank. We don't believe that um, you can actually have a mass market digital bank without having some kind of touch and without having some kind of customer education. When we looked at the bank, we didn't want to create a bank just for digitally savvy people. So what we thought is it, it's important is to um, kind of meet the customers where they are. So actually, you don't have to be digitally savvy to use and onboard onto a uh, time bank and open a bank account. You can, you know, walk walk with us on that journey, and that's what's been really important uh, to building out financial services in South Africa. South Africa has a largely bank population, but it's not well served in bank population, and it's quite expensive where people have to pay to actually have a bank account. So we also disrupted all of the different types of fees uh, for our bank account, and that becomes very important when talking about women. So do you want to go? Through? So what this shows us is what's really important is actually how data works. So Carol explained in the report that uh, the Financial Alliance for Women, one of the great findings is that if you do sex disaggregated data, then you're going to be able to learn more about your customers and design better products and services for them. And also exposes a lot of uh, bias that may be coming through in the system that you would not think about. So um, often when financial institutions are initially presented with the idea of gender disaggregated data, they say, oh, but they don't do that because they want to be fair to everyone. But since most financial institutions have uh, more dominantly male boards and leadership, there's already inherent bias in there, which is why it's quite important from day one to do gender disaggregated data with a new bank or from a bank to actually start and do this type of data analysis. So at time, we have been doing this type of data analysis from day one. And we track uh, cohorts. So each month, 
we create for each month of operation that becomes a cohort and we track how that cohort is using the account and building um, their experiences in South Africa with Time Bank. So when we first started, and you can see we're comparing both the web and kiosk. So I explained to you how the kiosk operates and about 85% of our customers come in through the kiosk uh, and 15% download an app at their home and start interacting with Time Bank through the app. We do have an app just like most digital banks uh, globally, but what we found is that most people feel more comfortable uh, engaging with us through the kiosk and we think that the kiosk has been a key success factor for us. So if you look at this, you can see that while men and women were onboarding fairly closely and similar initially through the kiosk, uh, but then it, that expanded so that now more women are opening accounts through the kiosk. It was very different with the web where many more men were comfortable initially uh, onboarding through the web. This has now changed, so we're actually onboarding most men and um, women, more women, in time to bank through the web and kiosk, but we did notice them from the beginning. There was an issue where we had to enhance the web experience so that women would be onboarding there. So that was one of our first real major learnings. But that most important learning about the kiosk was that it was the better way to onboard. So when people are thinking about digital banks or providing app based services, I think it's really important to notice that while people think, oh, it's very easy to download an app and just onboard and start using it, that that can be quite challenging for people. And one thing that we learned is that if people can't use it very quickly, uh, then they uh, are labeled to drop off. So right now there's a question that says that the 85% of women favoring kiosks were of the older generation. Uh, that is actually not true. Uh, what we found is that the full demographic of South Africa was onboarding on the kiosk. So while there is a perception that it's very easy to use an app and do EKYC and onboard onto a financial institution through an app, it's actually much more challenging. And it requires taking pictures in interesting ways. And that always can lead to a lot of drop off. So we found that actually it's much easier for everybody to use the kiosk, men and women in all demographics. Uh, it's not just the older demographic that would be using the kiosk. Then we also tracked how uh, men and women are using the account on a day-to-day -day basis. So what we found is that women are using the account in much smarter ways than men are. So if you, we looked at this, that some of the most value-oriented products that we have is our send money where you can send money uh, person to person uh, from uh, your bank account and also doing card based deposits. So I explained that you can uh, actually do cash in and cash out at the cash register and we call that card based deposits. So those are our two kind of highly used and also uh, the most, I would say, um, the most value oriented products we have where in the reverse is with ATM usage. Since we don't have our own ATMs, the kiosk is only for account opening but does not have any cash. We can, uh, those with time bank accounts can use ATMs, but they're from other financial institutions and they're quite expensive. And what we found is that men were using very high usage for other ATMs, other financial service ATMs, whereas women were using the more value-oriented products with send money, and the card-based deposits. And this has really enabled us to get a lot of insights into how to design better products and services for women, but also the realization and recognition that women are going to be tracking quite closely how to use uh, the account. And so having very clear, transparent pricing strategies is a very good way to actually engage with, with women. So, uh, I think what I'll do now is, I think there are a couple of different questions. Um, so one, yeah, Thank so you, one thing is that it says um, preferential service rates to women owned companies. So actually what we don't think that there needs to be kind of different things for men and women. We just think that you need to design for 
uh, thinking about the needs and services for women. And if you design well thought out products, that that's going to make a big difference. So one of the key things that when we think about women is that they're time for it. And so if you think about how to design products to revolve around somebody who's time for, this means that it will also serve for women who are time for, but also help serve for men who are time for. So we are really actually at time opposed to kind of having different types of products saying this is a women's product and this is a men's product. We design and look at the data to think how best to design a product and then to move from there to think what is the best way to do that. So uh, we have been working with the Financial Alliance for Women. We actually participated in the hackathon. So I totally recommend next year. You won hackathon. the hackathon. And what, because I think probably there are people here who are interested in SME finance as well as consumers. So we are predominantly a consumer uh, focused in bank right now, but we are starting to move into SMEs. And we believe very strongly that if you want to work with SMEs, as particularly women owned businesses, that the idea of non financial services is very important. And if you go to the Financial Alliance for Women website, you're going to find a lot of information on what is a non-financial service. So we actually are partnering with, and that's what we did in the hackathon, is partnering with a non-financial service out of Singapore that enables uh, active selling on social media. So we believe that in the future, uh, there will be a second type of commerce, not just there's physical retail, then there's e-commerce right now. In the future, we believe that there's going to be much more what we call conversational commerce through social media like Facebook Messenger or uh, Instagram. And so this company is enabling women-owned businesses to help launch digital storefronts on social media and then sell through them. And then we do all the payments and we provide the financial services to those uh, women-owned businesses that are selling through social media. Uh, so this is the type of when you think about non-financial service, that's one aspect of non-financial service that works really well uh, with both men and women SMEs. But we've always seen that women uh, SMEs respond better to non-financial, well thought out non-financial service products. Yes, uh, thank you for that. Uh, maybe I, mm -hmm. I have a question for you, uh, Rachel. Uh, I wanted to talk about partnerships, and I know that partnerships were crucial, and I want you to maybe highlight from, from a, a user, um, um, I mean, a fintech perspective of what those partnerships mean, because, I mean, we explain it and we define it and, and we highlight how important it is, but I think when they hear it from a practitioner's perspective, it's it's quite different. So how crucial and, and critical were partnerships for you at, at different stages uh, of So uh, partnerships of is crucial and fundamental to what we're doing. So I, mean, I talked about the grocery store, uh, that is the most important partnership we have. And we have located the kiosk into these grocery stores throughout South Africa. Uh, and as well as the cash-based deposit uh, uh, that will happen in the grocery stores, as well as account opening, we've also uh, integrated into their smart, smart shopper program. So having an out having the bank account linked to people's uh, loyal, the loyalty program of the source has been incredibly important. One for the customers who then can have better experiences and more expansive uh, loyalty programs that they're involved in. But also uh, we have then share on the data with that, with the grocery store. So we're actually seeing uh, what people are buying in terms of the, whether it's the right, this type of toothpaste or this type of, uh, shampoo and that really has helped us develop algorithms for the lending so for us the most important partnership is the grocery store we've also launched a really a second very interesting partnership that we're rolling out right now which is with the largest church group in South Africa uh, that church group wanted to have a membership card and so they're we provided a time banking card as the membership card, and we're actually designed roaming kiosks. So we, the kiosks you saw in the picture, the ones in the stores, and the roaming kiosks are now going to be going to the church congregations to onboard uh, those members who are mainly underserved who are part of this church group. But we also have other types of, of partnerships. So 
as well in, as in our technology stack. We call it a loosely coupled microservice platform, which means that we, did, we built the integration in terms of our technology platform for the digital bank, but we're working with over 40 different vendors for the technology. We don't think that one institution can build all the technology, so we go for best and breed across all of the different vendors and then build integration in. So even in our technology stack, it's a huge, there's a big focus on partnership. Amazing, yes, uh, and thank you for that. And and one, if you're just a, a, a new FinTech, and I think a lot of these partnerships also give you the credibility to really enter and penetrate the market and, and get yeah. that, you know, that uh, confidence vote, let's say, with the crowd to really be able to integrate, I think. Uh, I have so trust here- is really uh, important. When you think of any new financial institution, you're yeah. really trying to build trust. So for uh, in South Africa, trust is, is important just like anywhere else in the world. So one is that pick and pay, the grocery store is a very trusted brand, so that was quite important. Secondly, we do think that even though mm -hmm. people use like a lot of social media or Facebook and they're using WhatsApp and all these different things with their phones, actually people are not as comfortable banking with their phone. So if you see a kiosk or you mm -hmm. get a, a, visa, a visa debit card that is something recognizable, all of those artifacts build trust. And again, that's why we think that there needs to be something beyond just the phone with digital banking to make it accessible for a mass market approach. Yeah, uh, thank you for that. Uh, I think, um, I don't know if we have more questions, maybe uh, Leila, uh, you appear to want to ask a question. Uh, I just shared as well our social media handle. Uh, Rachel, if you want to share yours in the chat so that they can follow Time Bank as well uh, and the Financial Alliance for Women. Um, so please, uh, yeah. Uh, if there are any questions, please go ahead. And I think I'm, I've overstepped the time by five minutes, but we also did start five minutes late. Um, maybe if the Berry Tech team can let us know if, if we have a bit more time. Uh, otherwise, I would like to thank our uh, our participants for being here with us. Uh, I also is uh, I also want to thank Rachel uh, for this uh, amazing session and for really being here with us. Uh, you know, Time Bank is uh, one of our newest members. Uh, it's great to have you. Uh, thank you for sharing, uh, you know, so honestly the, the time experience. And I think, uh, you know, there's a lot of learning opportunities to really understand the real value of data and partnerships and how crucial they are in really driving the, the fintech ecosystem forward. Um, and, uh, and that's it. Uh, so from our end, uh, please be gender smart, uh, be safe. Uh, thank you all for being with us. And and whatever questions you may have, uh, you have Rachel's email. I also sent the, the generic info at financialallianceformen.org email. Uh, please do reach out to us and I would love to help and would love to you know collaborate uh, further down the road. Mm -hmm. uh, Rachel, thank you. I know it's very, very late for you in Hong Kong. <laughs> uh, thank you for being with us and thank you all for being here. It's been great. Um, I hope you enjoyed the session and, and you got thank something you. out of it. Thank you all.